Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sabrina. Um, uh, born and raised in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, I come from a very tight knit family. Um, I have one sister uh, who is two years older than me. I would say that my upbringing was uh, a semi religious one. Um, I did spend a lot of time with my grandmother on my father's side growing up, and uh, she was a religious woman. Uh, we used to go to church on Sundays, um, had catechism classes, so we did our you know, the baptism, the first communion, the confirmation, and you know, prayed daily. Uh, so yes, I would say my upbringing was a semi-religious one. Um, I do have a lot of um, memories from my childhood. Uh, you know, of course, like celebrating um, Christmas and Easter. Uh, there was always like you know the the Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny aspect of those holidays, and then you also have the the more religious uh, view of those holidays as well. And you know, I. Um, our family, we did celebrate the, the more religious views of those holidays. Um, and I do have a lot of fond memories of, you know, praying uh, with my grandmother, um, you know, praying for our relatives that have passed away, um, also praying the rosary as well. Um, I would say that I did um, happily identify myself as a Catholic at the time. Um, we, we did read the Bible, um, you know, we learned it in, in church on weekends. Um, but I would say that I identified myself as a Catholic quite happily. Um, you know, um, my relationship um, with you know uh, Jesus, uh, peace be upon him. You know, as a Catholic was was a pretty strong one at the time growing up. Um, I would say that daily prayers were absolutely important. Um, you know, I couldn't go to sleep without you know praying that night, or else I would have like a guilty conscience. It just became like a, a habit that I had since you know as I grew up, even as I became, you know, a little bit more distant from the religion and, you know, didn't attend church every Sunday um, as I got older. Um, but I did always pray. It, that is something that I always kept uh, as a daily thing. Um, my views of Islam uh, prior to converting, um, I, was, I was a teenager, of course, at the time, so I didn't really have uh, a lot of knowledge of, you know, different religions. Uh, I would just, you know, the media did influence a lot of my opinion. I was quite ignorant to the religion and what it stood for and, you know, what Islam really was. Um, I just felt like it was something really foreign. Um, of course, I had, uh, you know, all the misrepresentations of the religion. I did have a negative view towards it uh, based on the media and all the events that had happened. Um, you know, for example, like, you know, the events of 9-11, you know, right away you see like this is a, you know, Islam is labeled on this type of thing. So when someone's ignorant of the religion, you're going to look at an event like that and say, well, why would the religion condone this? You know, why would Muslims condone this? Um, so for sure, I did have a negative view, you know, which was, of course, all misrepresented. But I did have a negative view of Islam prior, um, you know, as a teenager. My quest for Islam really began when my grandmother passed away. Um, because she was, you know, the main part of me, you know, of the, you know, all the religious aspects of my life growing up. When she had passed away, I was a teenager, and you know, like most teenagers, I was very, um, you know, I, I did pray every night, of course, but I, I was very distant from the religion at that time. And you know, when she had passed away, it was it was almost as though, like um, the same way, you know, you get into a car accident and you don't really ask for it. It's like it forces you to wake up because we're always postponing you know, those thoughts of, you know, what, what's after life, what is the purpose of life. And when you're a teenager, that's the last thing on your mind. You know, even though you might have, you know, spiritual feelings towards, you know, religion and God, uh, of course, you're going to, you know, you're too busy with your, your social life and such things. Whereas when she passed away, I felt like it just forced me to wake up and, and look at my life from outside of the box. And, you know, I was, you know, ashamed with what my life was at that time. And I felt that, you know, I should be reflecting, you know, in action what is in my heart, you know, because I did have, you know, a huge, you know, you know, spiritual side that I felt that I was always neglecting at the time. I came across the Holy Quran, um, not necessarily like uh, in a specific event. Of course, um, when I had decided I was wanting to learn more about different religions and learn about Islam in particular. Um, of course, I did look to, you know, the Quran. I, I did a lot of online research where, of course, you see a lot of, you know, good and bad, of course. So I did prefer books at the time. Um, I was given an English version of the Quran, and um, this was all prior to me converting, I would say, a good year, a year and a half prior. Um, and, of course, I read it, you know, front to back. And yeah. <laughs> the particular verse that I would say that inspired me in the Quran um, was, uh, you know, the fact that there is a whole chapter named Miriam, uh, of course, 
you know, as you know, coming from a Catholic background, you're like, oh, this is so familiar to me, you know, and then everything that, you know, the specific verses that talk about uh, the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, of course, that, you know, resonated with me, you know, coming from a Catholic background and, and the, the concept of Jesus, I would say, you know, once I learned that from the Quran, I felt that it totally changed my whole aspect, you know, the, my whole view of being a Catholic was totally shattered uh, after reading uh, Surah Miriam. My view of hijab prior, uh, prior to learning about Islam, um, I would see uh, Muslim women wearing it. I would assume that they were, you know, either forced to wear it or, you know, that it was some sort of, you know, written in stone rule that, you know, it's like maybe they didn't want to wear it, but they felt that they had to as Muslims. So, you know, of course, I didn't, I didn't really like the idea of anything that, you know, where you're being told to do something. Of course, that that's viewed as something oppressive, which, you know, even today there is that that misrepresentation still stands with a lot of people. You know, they see a woman in hijab, they assume that, you know, she's oppressed or she doesn't have equal rights. So, of course, I did have that, those same views prior, but, you know, now, you know, after looking into it, of course, um, you know, I look at the hijab as a totally different light, a totally different, you know, view where it's, you know, it's very liberating, you know, for a woman to wear hijab. And it's, it's absolutely a choice, whereas, I mean, it is, it is written in the Quran. It is, you know, all the, all the things that's required from us as Muslims. You know, there there are written things, but there's no compulsion in the religion. So of course, these are the type of things where y you would decide to do it for yourself, not because you're not convinced by it or you don't want to wear it. I would say the media did uh, affect uh, my view of Islam. Um, I think the same way it would affect a lot of people that don't have any base knowledge of Islam. If someone's just, you know. They see Muslims, they're not familiar with the religion, and then they're being told, you know, all these atrocities are happening, you know, in the name of Islam, or, you know, people that are doing outrageous things in the name of Islam. Of course, you're going to, you know, without any base knowledge to, of Islam to say, no, Islam doesn't, you know, condone such behavior, Islam is against such behavior. Of course, you're going to automatically assume that, you know, Islam is somehow responsible for, for those actions. So the media does a pretty good job at, like, you know, propagating that image that Islam is associated with, you know, so much negative in the world, but it's, it's not the case. Uh, it's not the case. After learning about Islam, of course, you know, you, you come to realize that, you know, you're living in a world where Islam is so badly misrepresented by the media, by people, by Muslims themselves as well. And, you know, when you're looking into the religion, it, it's like you're almost confused because you're like, you know, so many people are quoting the Quran to say this, you know, Quran says this, or, you know, do all these crimes, and you're, you know, you're looking at it and you're like, no, it doesn't, you know, and then even Muslims are helping to fuel that, that ignorance, that hate, because they're saying, oh, you know, the, the Quran says this, you know, and, you know, so you have like people mis, misquoting the Quran, misrepresenting the religion from inside and outside, you know, and I feel like all it really takes is that person to just pick up a book, pick up the Quran, and just read it front to back, and you won't find, you know, what, what the media is, you know, trying to tell you what Islam is. You know, don't look at the Muslims um, for your opinion on Islam. Pick up the Quran, which is, you know, the root, you know, the, the fundamental, <laughs> you know, book of Islam, of course, and read it and you'll come to realize, you know, that it's, it's not the case. Um, so the day that I officially reverted, uh, that I did my Shahada, was the uh, Mawlid al Nabi. It was at a friend's house. Uh, she was having a uh, get together for women um, at her house, like kind of like a small like party, I guess, sort of thing. And um, it had already been like a year that I'm learning the religion at this point, and uh, they had brought it up to me um, if I was, you know, interested in, uh, you know, if I was ready in doing my shahada, and you know, without any pressure, you know, telling me like take your time, you know, just. And of course, at that time, I was, you know, more than ready. I had, you know, had already learned, you know, so much at that point. I had already accepted Islam in my heart. Um, so I was just, I don't know what was, you know, stopping me from doing my shahada. I guess I was just like scared to take that last final official step. Uh, so I remember uh, I did my shahada and uh, shortly after, you know, like 30 seconds it took to sink in and I just sat down and I remember just bursting into tears and, um, you know, obviously not tears of sadness. It was tears of happiness, but uh, even more so tears of relief, you know. It was as though, like, I had, you know, as I said, I, I had accepted Islam, uh, you know, such, it had been already a long time coming, and just to officially say it out loud to, you know, to my shahada was just like, it was such a relief to just finally, you know, make that official step that I knew going forward from that day, from that moment, that 
you know, I was going to be identifying myself as a Muslim. Uh, so it was definitely uh, an amazing experience and I remember like I needed time to myself. I went to like one of the rooms upstairs and I had called one of my best friends at the time and I had told her, you know, like just like any other thing, you know, when something happy happens in your life, you want to call the people that you, you know, you love and care about and you want to tell them the good news. And I remember telling her and, you know, her reaction was like, well, what do you want me to tell you? Like, you know, which was which was definitely disappointing. but. It also made me realize a lot in that moment, you know, like about, you know, how you can have like, you know, brothers and sisters in humanity and brothers and sisters in faith. Um, so from that moment forward, I was kind of like able to differentiate, you know, my relationship, my relationship with different people, which, you know, you know, I think it is important to have, you know, relationship with all kinds of different people. But, you know, you, you stand in different places with different people, that's for sure. Um, my family's reaction to uh, me reverting to Islam, um, alhamdulillah, they were more than supportive. Um, they continue to be more than supportive. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, my family is very tight-knit. Um, my family, like, I, I couldn't picture any, any better family to, you know, the way that they've supported me in everything, you know, from when I announced it to them, you know, whatever makes you happy, whatever brings you closer to God, you know, do whatever you feel is good for you. Um, you know, from when I started to wear the hijab, you know, you know, complimenting the way that I wear it or, you know, such things. And, you know, if there was a, a party, you know, like a cousin's, you know, cousin's birthday or a cousin's, you know, anything um, where, you know, there was going to be food served, they always made sure to look out for me, you know, make sure that there's either fish or vegetarian option or, you know, and my aunt especially, she's, she's amazing. Every holiday, you know, it's always at her house and she always makes sure to, you know, to go to where I buy my meat and, you know, whether it's Thanksgiving turkey, it's halal, whether it's like, you know, a Christmas dinner, it's halal no matter what. So my family is, you know, alhamdulillah, like I couldn't ask for, you know, more supportive family for sure. I would say that the, the hardest thing um, going from, you know, being Catholic to, you know, being a Muslim, the, the hardest thing to accept. I don't think there's anything necessarily hard to accept about the truth, just, you know, coming to terms with it. Um, the only thing that did take some time, you know, of course, when you're raised, you know, with, you know, with a religion, you know, especially with the concept of Jesus, um, it does, you know, I did totally like switch, you know, it, it, I didn't really believe in the concept of Jesus the way Catholics do from the minute that I learned the Islamic perspective, but it does take some time to, you know, adapt to that idea, um, you know, after being Catholic for so many years and, you know, looking at, you know, uh, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, in, in such a way and then having to change that. Um, I would say that was, you know, be maybe the, the hardest part, I would say. My first year as a Muslim uh, was uh, it's quite an experience. Um, you know, from when I did my Shahada, uh, you know, I was, you know, you have to start reading the ingredients of things, making sure there's no gelatin and, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it takes adapting, it takes getting used to, uh, of course, you know, and then there was my first Ramadan, uh, so I had to fast, you know, for the first time. I was really excited about it. Um, you know, I had uh, started to wear hijab at this time as well. I, I, I wasn't prior, only unless I was going to the masjid, so I decided to start wearing the hijab officially. Um, with my first Ramadan and um, you know the first year there's there's so much so much adapting you know you learn so much about yourself um, you, you of course you're always learning more about the religion that's something that never changes um, but you you know it takes time to adapt for sure um, I had quit my job at the time um, you know you start to really see especially with hijab I, f I feel like you, you know you're really labeled as a Muslim going forward in society when you start to wear the hijab and um, this can be a challenge for some people and I felt like at the time you know I, I had to quit my job just because I needed that extra time to like really you know grow within myself and you know feel comfortable with my decisions and not feel like I needed to explain myself or you know go against the grain per se and you know going to school also everyone everyone looks at you like you know did you know did you lose your mind like what's going on like you just come in with hijab one day and you know of course, like, you know, I didn't have the whole wardrobe set, so I'm like all mismatched and like just trying to, you know, dress as modest as possible. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I think having a support system is, is really important in the first year. You know, of course, I had my family. I had really amazing, you know, friends, you know, to help me, you know, support me in, in these things. So, I mean, it wasn't hard, but it definitely, there's always, you know, takes a lot of adapting for sure. When I, after I did my Shahada, I mean, even prior, 
to doing my Shahada, I, I did have a lot of support from the Muslim community. Um, I was attending the masjid prior, uh, so I did have a, a, you know, a huge support system in terms of you know, the Muslim community. Um, they definitely helped me out a lot you know, in terms of like writing down the prayer for me, like the transliteration so I can pronounce it in Arabic properly, um, you know, the steps, um, everything, books, any books that I might, ne might have needed, you know, they supplied me with. Um, even when I decided to wear the hijab, they did like a little, little get together party for me, and like you know, everyone brought me hijabs, and you know, which was like definitely like appreciated at the time. It was really nice and heartwarming to see like, you know, people gather, you know, people be supportive on on such a deep level. You know, when you know when these are like your sisters in Islam. You know, it's such a it's such a deep connection that you can have with such people. Uh, but they, I definitely had a lot of support uh, from them. I would say my most difficult challenge. Um, when embracing, uh, after embracing Islam, uh, wasn't so much a challenge that came from myself. It was more um, having to live in a society where Islam is misrepresented, where Muslim women are misrepresented, where there's so much um, confusion as to you know what Islam stands for. And um, so, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with with my decision. I I did my own research. I'm you know I'm happy with my decision. I'm happy with the person that I am and that I continue to grow to become. Um, the only challenge is you know when you're living in a society where you constantly need to you know justify or prove you know or where people are always trying to make you compromise on you know something important. You know like oh well for example just to give an example here, um, you know if you're going to go to like uh, you know someone's birthday party. You know, they're they're not Muslim. Let's say they they want to go to a place that serves alcohol or like you know a little bit more of like a you know night atmosphere type of thing. And it's like, oh well, you can come. You don't have to drink or like you know. It's like I, I don't feel that I need to you know compromise my beliefs in order to you know make other people happy. I feel like you know I've set you know certain you know expectations of my own self and I need to stick by them. And I feel like society is always kind of trying to tug at you to you know, try to make you like lean one way, you know, whether it could even be with hijab, you know, like, you know, why don't you wear, you know, hijab this way or why don't you wear more makeup or, you know, it's always about pleasing the others, you know, always about pleasing other people. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with myself and, you know, I'm just happy like pleasing Allah. So I don't have to worry about society, but it, it is a challenge, you know, because I mean, that's where we live, right? <laughs> Was I able to decipher the difference between religion and culture? Um, I think as a revert, uh, absolutely. I think um, you see it on, like I see it before I, I reverted, I see it after I reverted. You see it in, in all religions and cultures, um, you know, especially when you're looking at a religion that's, you know, the predominant religion of a specific country. You know, for so many years, you, you know, the, the religion tends to get mixed with the culture and you know, both of those things on their own are great. You know, religion is a great thing. Culture is a great thing. You know, you can, you know, it's amazing to learn about other cultures, the food and, you know, all that sort of thing. But when you're mixing them both in the same pot, um, you know, you're not able to, you know, to serve it to everybody, right? Because like, for example, if, you know, if, if you're, you know, from, let's say, a Muslim country where you've been raised in, in a certain way that culture has been really intertwined with the religion, um, you know, in the same pot, and then you start to see, like, you know, you're taking the halal with the haram, and the haram with the halal. Um, you have to really draw the line between culture and religion. I think it's important because, you know, that's what also keeps a lot of people away uh, from the religion as well. Is you know, they 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 will associate, you know, the backwards customs or you know the things that they might not agree with because it's not, you know, from their culture, let's say, with the religion, and that person is labeling that with with the religion. And I think it's. It could be a very poisonous thing. Um, I think it is important, even though those two things are good on their own, uh, it is really important to draw the line um, between the two. You know, of course, you know, with, within any community, um, whether it's like a church or a mosque or a synagogue, um, you tend to have, you know, based on language preference, you, you tend to have, you know, like let's say most like Pakistanis will go to like a Pakistani, you know, a mosque where they will speak the, you know, Urdu, let's say, and, and you know, Arabic mosque, you know, the different dialects they'll go to a specific mosque where they're comfortable with the dialect that they understand which is which is fine um, I mean it's important to you know to mix and you know integrate with different communities but in, but when you're going to the same place um, and you're you know going there for religious reasons and they're mixing the culture and then it's like that's how you start to have like you know 
oh, I don't want to go to this mosque because they, you know, they'll do it this way and they do it that way, where there shouldn't be any specific ways based on cultures because Islam is a universal religion, it's for all cultures. Um, so we shouldn't have to have, you know, people feeling uncomfortable or, you know, feeling that they can't go to a specific place, you know, based on cultural practices that are mixed in with the religion, um, for sure. The reason uh, I chose um, Ahlul Bayt um, to, you know, to follow them, you know, the word Shia means followers of Ahlul Bayt, you know, so this is our, our examples. Um, this is, you know, these are our role models uh, in Islam. Um, Ahlul Bayt to me is essential to the religion of Islam and, you know, to learn about the Imams and the way that they lived their life, the way that they uh, were martyred. Um, you can have a university class, um, you know, multiple semesters, just, you know, learning about it, just learning about the different Imams, their, their cause, their sacrifice. Um, you know, Imam Hussein, salam, for example, like the, the, the events of Ashura, um, you know, that took place in Karbala, like this is something like, you don't have to necessarily be Muslim. Um, you can be anybody with, with any sense of humanity um, and look at the story and be completely inspired by it. So, I mean, as Muslims, you know, you know, you know, we'll call ourselves Shia of Ahlul Bayt. You know, this is, we, it's, it's a responsibility on us. You know, we, we can't just know, you know, n with knowledge comes responsibility. And I feel like once we know that, you know, Imam Hussein salam, did this sacrifice, you know, we, we can't just let the day-to-day -day oppression that happens, you know, go by without us standing, you know, standing up against it. We need to be the flag bearers um, of his message. We need to continue that, you know, this is our responsibility as Muslims. So for me, Ahlul Bayt is not just an inspiration. It, it's completely essential as, you know, as my responsibility as a Muslim to the religion of Islam. When, when I was learning about Islam, you know, I, I made sure to check every corner, you know, all the different, you know, I, I learned about the Sahaba, I learned about uh, Ahlul Bayt, um, and, you know, I, I would say, coming from a Catholic background, the, the story that stood out to me the most um, would be, you know, the, the events of Karbala, you know, Ashura, because, you know, when, you know, as a Catholic, we believe, you know, that, you know, Jesus died for your sins, right? Uh, so there's that sense of, you know, deep emotion and love towards uh, Jesus, from a Catholic perspective, um, there's a lot of you know love there. You know, um, Imam Hussein also sacrificed, right? Uh, so I think a lot of Christians can look at the story, you know, and resonate with it. And where I was at that point, learning about Islam, for me, it was like it, it was almost like Imam Hussein was like you know my new my new Jesus, you know my new you know the my new like inspiration in life, you know, he, he sacrificed, he did the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, so for me, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it became essential. It wasn't just like, you know, here's Islam and, you know, here's, here are all the different, uh, you know, details surrounding it that are, you know, you know, important, but not essential for me. Ahlul Bayt, that, that's where the difference was drawn is that it wasn't just an important aspect of Islam. It was completely essential. Um, to Islam. I would say a, a personality that I feel the most connected to um, would be Imam Hussein alayhi salam, um, but of course it's not limited to that alone. Um, the, reason, the reason why I say this is um, because, you know, with everything that's happening in today's world, like anybody of any religion, whether they're, you know, even atheists, will all agree that, you know, humanity is, you know, slowly being <laughs> torn down. Um, there's, al there's, always, there's always oppression happening. Um, Every day, you know, you can look at the news and you can see a story and, and just feel like, you know, we're, you know, we're here comfortable in our country, you know, we don't have so much going on, you know, although it is catching up to us as well, because, you know, op oppression, oppressors, you know, tyranny, all this, you know, if, if it's knocking on someone else's door, you know, and banging it down and oppressing somebody on the other side of the world and you're not doing anything about it, you know, in your comfortable bubble where you are right now, eventually that tyrant's going to come knocking on your door. And I think that's what we're seeing today as well. Uh, you know, we're living in such a, you know, peaceful country and little by little we look at the media and, you know, these things are happening, you know, here as well. And I feel like it's, it's the bigger picture, you know, that's what Imam Hussein stood for. It wasn't about just the religion, it was about humanity. And humanity is, I mean, the word human, something we all have in common regardless of religion. Um, and I think this is why he's an inspiration, you know, not just for Muslims, not just for me, but for everybody, anybody with a sense of humanity. And it's, it's like a responsibility, you know? We, we have to stand up 
as a, you know, all together, you know, Muslims, Christians, which we see now, it's happening now. Um, there's a lot of unity based on humanity, you know, like there's, there's a lot of unity because, you know, maybe it's not the same religious cause, but it's the same cause. We're all, we're all, it's all good against evil, right? Um, bad people, they don't, they don't take their days off. They don't, um, so it's, it's the good people that have to stand up against it, you know, like we, we don't want to, like good people are always going to be like, you know, try to look and see the best, you know, like maybe these things are not as bad as they seem, but as we can see, the world is slowly getting worse and worse. Uh, so we're, I mean, we're, we're all going to have to stand up united against, you know, all the bad that's happening. So for, for me, Imam Hussein is that ultimate role model, that ultimate figure. I mean, there's been many in, 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 in the world, you know, like, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., for example. There, there's been so many role models uh, that go down in history, but Imam Hussein is, is the ultimate one. Um, I did have the opportunity to, to go visit, alhamdulillah. Um, it was actually um, after, after my wedding. Uh, we had planned it as like our honeymoon destination. Uh, so we did, uh, we did plan it, we went. Um, it was obviously a dream of mine from the very, you know, from the get-go, just to be there in person was, um, you know, it's, it's hard to explain it in words. I, I guess people that have been can, can relate to it. It's, the, the only, it, it's very hard to explain it in words. It's, it's, a, it's all felt with the heart. Um, I remember when the plane was arriving uh, in Najaf, I remember like just, you know, crying on the plane. It was just like a, a total mix of like excitement. I just, you know, to be there was like a dream come true. And I felt, um, you know, so at home. Uh, I felt really, you know, at peace with myself. It was like a piece of heaven on earth. That's how I really felt. And, you know, when I, when I entered, um, you know, the shrine of Imam Hussein, uh, you know, the, it was just, generally it was just beautiful. Um, you know, the chandeliers, there was birds in the chandeliers. It, like, it honestly felt like heaven. And I remember we had gone for Maghrib and Isha prayer. It was my first day there. We had to go straight there, of course. <laughs> and um, I remember I, I couldn't even pray because I, I was just a wreck. Like, I was just too, too emotional, too happy, and just, like, I, I was just tears of joy. And um, it, was, it was very surreal for me. And, you know, I would love nothing more than, you know, to go back, you know, over and over again because it's just... It's like a, a piece of heaven on earth, to be honest. Um, did I struggle with the concept of intercession? Uh, I don't think I did. Um, I know it's a huge debate within the Muslim community. Um, for me, it's quite simple. Uh, it's mentioned in the Quran multiple times. Um, every time it is mentioned, it is, it's also followed by with his permission, by Allah's permission. So, I mean, Allah is, you know, is, capable of all so you know and when we learn about the you know status of Ahlul Bayt I think this is this is the very crucial part when learning about this because we know you know intercession you know is possible by Allah's permission so I mean who who would be worthy you know of interceding for anybody except for you know somebody who's completely perfect um, you know and this is where it's important to look at Ahlul Bayt you know and learn about who they were, and I feel like with that knowledge, it becomes an easier concept to understand. Um, my first time, uh, well, my first Muharram was actually prior to me um, doing my Shahada, before I actually officially became a Muslim. Um, when I was learning about the religion, I decided, okay, I need to go to the masjid. I need to like really see what it's about. I want to meet Muslims, you know? And it was, it happened to be during Muharram, and uh, it's almost like perfect timing because I remember going in and um, they were reciting uh, Ziyarat Ashura and I remember there was a sister uh, you know beside me and when it was time to do sujood towards the end uh, you know she made me like do sujood with her and like and I remember just thinking like you know I didn't understand the language at the time but you know I was totally intrigued I was intrigued you know and then when they were reciting the eulogies you know about the events that took place um, during Ashura like I had already a little bit of you know knowledge about, you know, Ahl al-Bayt, but I, not, not so much in detail um, at that time. And they were, you know, everyone just began to cry. And I remember thinking, thinking like, you know, what a, what a beautiful thing, like, you know, so of course, naturally, you know, you're going to go home and learn even more into detail about, you know, Ashura and, you know, why, you know, why are people mourning, you know, this event? And of course, you know, Anybody with half a heart would, you know, also break down in tears with this story. So for me, it was just my, my first time ever entering the masjid was during Muharram. So 
um, you know, that was an amazing experience for me and I feel like it really, that's also why Imam Hussein alayhi salam is such an inspiration for me because he was like, I guess the, you know, the part, you know, the part that really made me, you know, so convinced, you know, of Islam, you know, like for, for somebody to sacrifice it all uh, for that, you know, it really made me feel like this, this is the right path, you know, following Ahl al-Bayt is the right path. And, you know, and then of course, after I did my Shahada, after I had already been officially Muslim, you know, I would go to the processions, um, which I found were really amazing because, you know, you're, you're out in, in public, you know, and you're, you're telling people about the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, you're telling, like, and it's relevant to them because, you know, it, it, as I said, he, he's a role model for anybody, like, you know, from a humanitarian perspective. So, you know, people would, you know, I remember one winter was my first time doing the procession and uh, it was, you know, a woman had asked me, what is, you know, what is all this? You know, what's going on? And, you know, the procession had kept going and going and, you know, they, I had lost them in sight. They were already gone. And I was just talking with this woman. I remember my feet were so cold, I couldn't feel them. And we were just talking and talking. And she was, she knew who he was, you know, and she was like, you know, um, uh, a French uh, Quebecois lady, not a Muslim. And she's like, yes, I learned about him, you know, you know, from a very long time ago. And she was so intrigued to know more. And, you know, we had like, you know, a, a beautiful conversation about it. And I just thought like, this is what it's about. You know, it's about spreading the message. And, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience, the procession. The events of Karbala inspired me. Um, I, I would say like they would inspire anybody um, when you learn about, you know, the events that took place. Um, it's, a, it's such a hard question to answer in detail uh, because, I mean, there, there's so many aspects of it, right? Um, you know, you have, you know, sacrifice upon sacrifice, you know, the, you know, Abbas, like, going to the water, you know, and then throwing it back, you know, because he, he couldn't drink water, you know, knowing that, you know, Imam Hussein and Sukaina uh, were thirsty. And it's just, made, you know, every time I drink a glass of water right now, I, there's, you know, I can't not remember that. You know, you know, Ashura, the events that took place is something that it sticks with you on a daily basis in life. You know, even when I put my hijab, you know, sometimes it's it's not easy. You know, sometimes you do, you know, want to conform to society standards of fashion. And then I remember, you know, you know, Zainab, you know, and Islam and like how, you know, how she had to, you know, the struggles that she had to put up with after, um, you know, and having her hijab taken from her and it's just like, this, it, it's an honor, you know what I mean? It's something that, like, remembering the events of Ashura, it, it's, it's essential in everyday life. It, it takes everything into perspective, you know? Um, whether you're drinking water, whether you're, you know, struggling with wearing hijab or how to wear hijab, um, everything really, whether it's standing up against tyranny, you know, sometimes it could be even be a bully in school and you're just like, you know what, like, there's no way Imam Hussein would let you, you know, do what you're doing to this person. And it makes, you, it, it makes you be brave, you know. It gives you courage to stand up for what's right, even if the cost is your life. Um, and I feel like that's, it's just an amazing, you know, amazing thing that everybody, like everybody needs to know the story. Everybody needs to, you know, take it into consideration on a day-to-day day -day basis because, like, it's something that you carry with you every day in life. I think I think the, the the Muslim community in general is is doing a pretty good job in letting the world know about Imam Hussein. Um, I, I noticed that you know in, in the years that I that I've been a Muslim, like I feel like more and more people are aware. You know, more and more people ask questions about Imam Hussein alayhi salam in particular, and I feel like it's an amazing thing because you know, as I said, it, it's. Uh, it's something that can affect anybody, whether they're Muslim or not. And I feel like that's, you know, that's the, the important part for most people, you know, whether they're non-Muslim, they need to know about, you know, the events that took place and how we can learn from that today. So history does not repeat itself because it is repeating itself. Um, so, I mean, in general, I think Muslims are doing an, a you know, pretty good job. You know, you know, there's Ahlul Bayt TV now, like there, you know, people are able to we live in a society where it's not just books, right? You don't have to go to a masjid to, you know, ask questions and feel like, you know, you can go online, you know, you can pick up a book, you can go to, I'm sure anybody that has, a, you know, any Muslim friend, you know, ask them for, you know, ask them these questions. You know, people ask me questions. I'm more than happy to answer them, you know. Um, there's so many outlets available for people to learn the message. Um, but I mean, it, it's, 
it's a never ending thing, right? Until every until it's in every corner of the world, until every every single person knows, you know, who this you know, who Imam Hussein alayhi salam is, then I mean the job is not complete. It's not complete, but it's 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 getting there. And I feel like every year more and more people are knowing and it's I think it's great. Um, I would say my, my words of advice for anybody who is uh, looking to learn about Islam or um, looking to, you know, who, who's already looked into Islam and wants to, you know, m you know officially identify themselves as a Muslim. Uh, I think when learning about Islam, um, the, the only advice I can give is, you know, yes, you do need support, but do all the thinking on your own. Um, you know, get the books, you know, that's, a, you know, as far as it would go in terms of, you know, reaching out to people, but you want to make all those decisions on your own. You want to, you know, make sure that you're not being influenced by, you know, any outside people. Like, I mean, this is a decision you're making for God, right? So, I mean, we pray to God. God hears us all the time. So, you know, I would recommend just, you know, doing your due diligence in terms of the knowledge, you know, reading the books, and then just asking Allah for, you know, for the, you know, the guidance, you know, to make it easy for you. Um, with that being said, if ever you do find yourself at a point where you feel like, you know, this this is this is the truth. I need to accept it. This is this is also a hard, you know, hill to come over because, you know, knowledge is a responsibility. Um, you know, and and like me, when I came to the realization that you know Islam was the truth for me, uh, you know, there was no there was no turning back. Even if I wanted to, even if I said, you know, reverting seems like it would be a a hassle. Let me just you know stay as is and you know maybe go to the masjid occasionally no like it, for me i had to i had to you know do what i had to do um so i would just say like you have to have the courage to accept the truth once you, once you've come to it i would say uh, a message that i have for muslim viewers um would be to i guess i would say to um you know even though you're born in, into a religion, um, you know, it, it, you could be from like a predominantly Muslim country. Um, try not to associate the culture with the religion. Um, try to reach out to different communities. Try to have Islam unified as one, you know, as one ummah, the way it should be. Um, you know, not to differentiate between you know small differences, um, because in the end, I mean, this is not just Muslims in general. Even Christians, as I was saying earlier. This it's it's going to be you know there's good and then there's bad you know what I mean the small differences can be worked out but the good people do need to unite even if it's Christians and Muslims as we see happening in Iraq right now you know we have to unite against you know against the bad um, and as a Muslim community you know to use excuses such as culture you know to divide you know you know little little racial you know things here and there whether it it's you know a matter of marriage or these things I feel like that that needs to all be put aside because it's not it's not Islam um, you need to hold to the religion you know as one ummah you know so you know take take the, the culture with a grain of salt you know culture is a good thing but do, don't let it interfere with the, you know the righteous message of Islam